Welcome to the Ted Lewis World Constellation. Welcome to those who are watching us on the stream, either live or our archive streamed. This is the third in our series of TWED Talks, or Ted Lewis World Wednesday Night Educational Sessions. Uh, so far this term, we've had uh, a talk uh, led by Dominic DeFranzo on mashups. Uh, well, it was, a, it was a, a, what was it, a bootstrap, a bootstrap presentation on uh, JavaScript, triples, and mashup creation. Uh, we had an, an introduction to our conversion process, our linked open data conversion process by Tim Lebo. And tonight we're going to have kind of a, a loose question and answer, uh, example driven um, and hack oriented uh, presentation on Sparkle with a special emphasis on Sparkle 1.1 by Gregory Todd Williams. Greg is a fifth year PhD student. <laughs> he becomes a tenured, a tenured grad student after, after a bed. Uh, uh, among other things, uh, Greg works on our linking open and government data team. Uh, he also is serves on the W3C uh, Sparkle working group, where he's been spending a lot of time working on Sparkle 1.1, uh, which he's going to cover a bit tonight. Um, I want to have a reminder: this we we alternate, we try to alternate weeks, TWED talks with tech hack sessions on the same Wednesday night slot, 7 to 9 o'clock. Uh, next week we had a talk scheduled for. OWL and OWL 2. It looks like we're going to have to reschedule that. So watch the calendar at tw.rpi.edu slash web slash twed, T-W-E-D. Uh, next week may be a tech hack session or it may be uh, another talk. Um, but we'll keep you posted on the website. So there's some requests for OWL and OWL 2 and RDFS not going too late um, in the uh, yeah, we're trying. You know, we were trying. To, we tried to have that as early as possible, but the person who's presenting that may have some scheduling problems, so we're trying to work that out. Okay. okay. There's not just a single person presenting, right? Well, we could have a we could have another person drop in if we get some volunteers, but let's do that offline. Okay. Um, so I'd like to jump into this. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome Greg. Uh, so it wasn't. Uh, entirely clear to me uh, the range of experience with Sparkle. I know some people here have a lot of experience. Um, does everyone here have at least a little bit of experience? Some of the previous talks, I think, covered it a little bit. Who's your previous Maybe. talks? Previous talks? Covered it a little? Yeah. All right, well, so I mean, this is a little hard um, trying to cover such a wide range of, of experience uh, in that respect. But, I'm going to try to um, breeze through uh, kind of the, the fundamental stuff of Sparkle 1.0. Um, and then I've got slides for pretty much all of the query side of Sparkle 1.1, which is the new version. Um, but I'm much happier, and I suspect you'd be much happier if we were talking about something that was interesting to you. So uh, at any point, I'm ha more than happy to switch to uh, questions, examples data you've got. Um, I was thinking if we make it all the way through the slides, we can switch over and I've got some examples on some data or even better if anyone else has data sets or queries or features they'd like to talk about. Um, you know, I think that would be preferable. And are yeah. you going to point out when it makes sense to use Sparkle 1.1 or does it always make sense to use Sparkle 1.1 over 1.0? Um, with respect to features of the language? Yeah. I think, so the question was, when does it make sense to uh, use Sparkle 1.1 uh, versus 1.0? I think really the deciding factor there is what tools you're working with. 1.1 um, support is still kind of sporadic. Uh, and so if you need something to work with the tools you've got, they may not support all of 1.1. Um, as far as uh, query features, uh, if it supports it, pretty much always makes sense to use it, I think. I mean, there's a lot of new things you can do with it. And for the things that you could do before, it's generally just gotten a tremendous amount easier. So negation is the big example there. It was possible in 1.0, but no one ever wanted to do it because it was so ugly. 
So pretty much always makes sense if your tool is supported. Um, anyway, so uh, I'll just jump in here. Um, hopefully, for those who haven't seen it, you'll be able to kind of hang with it. But if you can't, you know, I can jump over to the whiteboard or whatever. Just raise your hand, shout out, whatever. Um, so at most basic level, right? Sparkle stands for the Sparkle Protocol and RDF Query Language. Um, this is the standardized query language for uh, querying RDF. It's um, been standardized. Uh, the standardization process took a long time, but it became a standard in 2008. And uh, the Sparkle 1.1 work started uh, in 2009. Uh, so that's been going for several years now. It's mostly stabilized, but it's not doesn't have the standardization kind of stamp on it yet. So um, there's some implementations, uh, but like I said, some tools, you know, your mileage may vary on what tools support it. Um, so just on implementations, um, pretty much any language you want is going to have uh, a Spark implementation in it. Um, Arc is the, the kind of big one in the Java world, and Rascal uh, or Redland is the big one in the C world. Um, I'm going to plug mine, uh, which is a Perl one, um, if that doesn't, you know, scare you off. Uh, but there, there's uh, implementations, you know, in, in any scripting language you want. Uh, you know, just Google around, you'll find them. Um, and then I've got two links here to uh, online forums where you can type in a query, give it a URL of some data, and just play with it that way so you don't have to install any software locally. So uh, that should get you going, you know, later on if you want to uh, do your own sparkling. So we can just dive right in here. Um, this is. Uh, kind of the breakdown of all the parts of a Sparkle query. Uh, this is a select query. There are a couple of other different query forms, but this is the one, you know, 95% of the time, this is the one you're gonna use. Uh, and this is showing Sparkle 1.1 one, one stuff, so we'll get to some of these features later on. Uh, but basically, it starts out with some prefixes. You can use these to, you know, shorten your eyes. Um, uh, the select is the type of query you're asking for. You're saying, I wanna uh, give me back uh, values that are, are match variables in Query pattern. You specify the data you're operating over, or if you leave the, the from clauses out, it'll use a default data set uh, if your database is set up to provide one. Uh, you have your query pattern, which is where kind of the, the bulk of the work happens. Then group by or aggregates, adding for aggregates. You can sort your results, limit the number of results you get, uh, and you know page down into them with offset. So uh, anyone, I'm hoping everyone has at least also some familiarity with SQL. A lot of this should look familiar. Uh, it's this syntactically very uh, closely tied to SQL. Um, you know, a lot of the, the syntax form comes from SQL. Um, so hopefully that looks a little bit familiar. Uh, also, hopefully what's familiar is uh, even if you haven't done a lot of Sparkle, um, if you're familiar with RDF, hopefully you know Turtle. It's the, most, you know, the easiest syntax for RDF. And uh, the, the kind of core of Sparkle uh, takes all of its syntax from Turtle. So URIs are going to be surrounded by you know, the angle brackets, or if you've got a prefix set up, you can use the key name form uh, for short URIs. Literals come in plain literal form. They can have a language tag attached to them, or they can have a data type. Um, and then there are some syntactic shortcuts here. You can, without quotes, uh, make literals for Boolean uh, data types by just saying true or false. Um, integers don't need quotes, they turn into, you know, XST integers. Same thing for decimals with a, you know, a dot in the middle. And then the special predicate A um, turns into RDF type. So uh, all of that is, comes straight from Turtle, so hopefully that's familiar. And then the query stuff, um, variables can show up anywhere um, an RDF term could, so in a triple pattern. Variable we'll start with either a question mark or a dollar sign. Question mark is far more common, um, but either works equally well. Comments, use a hash mark, runs straight to the end. And then this is kind of, you know, bringing it all together. This is what a, you know, a query pattern would look like. So, you know, a variable with RDF type, both person and semicolon means, you know, continue using that subject and has a both name of Eve. So, if you put that in a query, you're saying, give me all the people with name Eve. Everyone with me so far? All right. So like I said, there are a couple different types of queries. Select is the big one. Almost all of your work is going to be with select queries. You're going to say, give me back uh, the values that match variables in the query pattern. Uh, you can also have ask queries, 
which is I don't care what the var what the values are, just tell me did the pattern match or not, so true, false. Construct queries uh, will basically act like a select query, but then take the values you get back and pump them right back into uh, another graph pattern, so you can construct your own RDF graph based on an RDF graph you're given, and describe uh, will be, it'll return a description in RDF of uh, the resources you're interested in, but the database gets to decide what the relevant data is there. So it's not all that useful in practice because you don't know what data is going to be returned. You can say, describe that person, but you don't know if you know, their name is going to come back or maybe their email address, don't know. So, you know, sometimes that can work, but implementation dependent, so, you know, beware. So, with that, um, I'm mostly going to... I'm sorry. Yeah. Do implementations specify how they respond to describe? Is that... No. Um, for most implementations, you can find out what algorithm they use, so uh, there are a variety of algorithms, mostly these are, are bounded description algorithms. So there's a concise bounded description is, I want to say, you know, the big one, but um, there are a couple of different ones on, on how they, given, you know, a resource you're asking it to describe, uh, the algorithm they use to, you know, tra traverse the graph and figure out what data to return. So for most implementations, you can look it up, but there's no formal way to find that out. Is there a reason why the specification didn't make that more specific for the describe when you set up the implementation detail? Uh, this was before my time. This was in the, the Spark 1.0 yeah. uh, working group. I don't know. Uh, this is like really uh, a good answer to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a balancing act between not wanting to be overly burdensome on implementers when, you know, if you're writing an implementation and you have very specific uh, use cases in mind, you may want uh, a description algorithm that wouldn't line up with the, the standard one if they, you know, specified that really, um, you know, specifically. So, I mean, it ends up being mostly good for, uh, I mean, poking around in a, de in a, a Spark one point, seeing what's there yeah, sometimes. I mean, to be honest, I, I think, you know, you kind of got to, you know, it can be useful sometimes, but it's not always clear when. Yeah. The default, all of the default, some of the default implementations are basically all the RDF graph, all the RDF molecules for any particular URI and subject. And when you do that, So, um, given that, I, I'm only really going to focus on select here. Um, we, if anyone you know wants to see examples of the other ones, we can dive into that later. Um, but I'm going to kind of dive into the the select stuff now. Um, well, the first part of this is will apply equally to all of them, right? So the, the kind of core of, of Sparkle is going to be the graph patterns, right? The stuff inside the curly braces, um, and uh, these are kind of the three you know big graph patterns. Uh, I've kind of stuffed filtering in here uh, as well as kind of the, the core uh, of Sparkle graph patterns. So basic graph patterns are just a set of triple patterns. So, um, you know, you have this query saying select all variables where, you know, P is of type person and has a book name, name, right? So you're going to get back a table with values for P and name. The basic graph pattern here is just made up of two triple patterns, uh, P, A, both person and P, both name, name, right? Uh, there's no restriction on shared variables or anything. Basic graph pattern is just a set of triple patterns. Uh, you can combine graph patterns with union. So you could say, give me back all of the things of type person or of type student. And this will just take the results from the first one and the results from the second one and return them. And optional is the other big graph pattern. Um, you can say, give me back all the things of type person, and optionally, if they have a home page in the data, I would like that as well. But if they don't, 
that's fine too. All right, so if your results are coming back in a table, this may mean you end up with empty cells in your table. All right, so P will always have a value, that's the person you're talking about. Uh, but all of the values for home page may be empty depending on you know, whether it was in the data. And then filtering um, allows you to constrain the results you get back from matching uh, those patterns. So here we're saying, give me back all the people uh, where their age is greater than or equal to 21. So pretty much any, you know, uh, arithmetic expression here, you know, you can do uh, range comparisons, equality tests, inequality tests, um, logical and and or, things like that. So um, hopefully that's, you know, fairly intuitive. Um, and then in addition to uh, those equality and um, range tests, there are some built-in functions you can use. Uh, these are all the built-in functions in Sparkle 1.0. Later on, we'll get to the tremendous number of new functions in Sparkle 1.1. Uh, but in Sparkle 1.0, data type would give you back the IRI if the argument was a data typed literal. So if you pass it an integer, you get back the IRI for access to integer. Is blank, is IRI, is URI, and is literal to return Boolean? telling you what the type of the argument is. All right, so if it's a literal, if it's a resource, if it's a blank. Uh, lang returns uh, the language tag of the literal if it's a language tagged literal. So if it's language tagged as a French literal, you'll get back the string fr. Um, the next one is lang matches. This will tell you, given a language string, so you know, in that example, fr would be the first operand here. Uh, and a language we want to match against, does it match, right? And so in this case, if what I popped out here was fr and the end, you could say no, they don't match, right? And this seems like you could just equally well use an equality test, right? Does lang v equals, you know, uh, en? Um, and that would work if you just had these two letter language codes. Language codes can also have a regional specific thing, so you can have British English, American English, uh, things like that. And so this would allow you to say, um, does it match English regardless of what you know regional uh, um, dialect it is? And uh, last two, stir will give you the lexical form of a literal. So if it's data typed, it'll strip off the data type. If it has a language, it strips off the language. Uh, and if it's a URI you know, resource, it turns it into a string. And finally, regex will give you back a true or false value depending on if the regular expression uh, matches the value. And then the third optional argument is flags. Um, this is, is another area where it's not standardized, what flags it takes. In general, I, you know, case insensitive, um, I think is the only one you can really rely on. But this should be, you know, uh, familiar to anyone who uses, you know, regular expressions and scripting languages, whatnot. So those are all the functions you can use in filters in Sparkle 1.0. Craig, is there any standard for the English packs, or for the language packs, or is that up to the data provider? Yes, um, it's, it's it's some, some ISO, ISO standard. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't remember the number, but there's a standard for this okay, sort of thing. In general, um, you know, we're not going to run this a lot, I would think. And if you do, it's going to be the obvious ones, right? Uh, I haven't seen a lot of use of like the the regional specific languages, things like that. But but yeah, there is a standard for that. Um, can you do stir star to just turn them all, whatever your results are, into literals too? Uh, no. Do we so, so these so only take a single value. So star uh, in a select clause is just, you know, shorthand for all of it. If you try to put the star inside of here, you'd be putting right like all the values into a function. It doesn't, no. <laughs> right. Um, although. Uh, well, no, I mean, <laughs> if you wanted to do it for all the variables in it, no, you have to write that out. So um, you can order results um, by just giving the variable name in an order by clause afterwards. Uh, you can also put an expression <coughs> here, um, which it will get, um, uh, you know, we'll get to some of the more complicated expressions later. Um, but here we're saying, Give me back all the people and their names and sort the list alphabetically by name, right? You can limit the number of results, so give me back those people and names. I only want 10 of them, or I want the second batch of 10, 
But if you're using offset, right, this says, give me a list. I'm only, only interested in some amount of them, but you know, slide that window down the list. Without an ordering, this doesn't make a lot of sense because you know, if you do limit 10, offset 0, you get the first 10. Limit 10, offset 10, you get the second 10. Maybe it's a different ordering this time around. Now you've got you know, duplicate results. So if you're going to use offset, it only really makes sense in the context of an ordering. So make sure it's you know some consistent ordering, and then you can page through them. Do uh, most of the implementations so if you're not actually interested in the memory, think that you're actually doing which are or will it? Is it doing a sort of optimization where if you've done a complex query and you do limit ten, then I can do offset ten? Will it justify it somehow? I'm not familiar with any implementations that would do that. I mean that would be. I mean you could you could certainly imagine how it would be done, but. Uh, especially if, if it's being made accessible through HTTP, you know, it's stateless. Uh, the database doesn't want to, you know, hold all these results in memory, hoping you might come back for a second go around, right? So, uh, no, I'm not familiar with any implementations that do do that, but that doesn't mean there aren't any. So, what's an example of actually using this for practical purposes? The slicing? No, the offset. Yeah, the offset. Uh, you want, uh, you know, uh, so you have a list of people and you want to display 10 per page. And you have a next, you know, yeah, you can't list of pages. Well, so you've got to sort it by something, right? So, I mean, if you're, you know, you're putting this on a web page, you don't want to just randomly display a list of people. They're probably sorted by, you know, their last name or a user ID or something. So, you know, in a lot of cases where you would use this, I don't think it would make sense to not be ordering them. So, you probably want to order them anyway, but if you don't, you're, you know, you're opening, opening yourself up to this not doing what you expect. Right. So, so what you're, you're saying, saying is, you know, in, for practical purposes, if you are ordering them by something, then it's pretty predictable if you know what you get the first 10, next 10, next 10, now that will work. Right. If you don't, don't order, order them, them, most implementations will probably do what you want, but there's no guarantee of that. So it's so another, you know, beware case. So you would wire this into the logic of a now, if you had some portal where you were displaying data sets or something like that, for example, yes, <laughs> yes. you would you would wire this into the how oh, you implemented the, the page in. Yeah. But, okay. yeah. So, so that's, that's basically, basically it for Sparkle One Zero. Um, hoping everyone kind of stuck with that. Um, I'm gonna dive into the Sparkle One One stuff. Um, there's quite a bit of it. I'm just kind of kind of go over it. I've got some example queries, but like I said. Much more interesting if we can get to you know real queries, real data. So, um, also I'll note, Sparkle one one is a set of standards. Uh, there's query update. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other specs. I'm only going to talk about query here. Um, I've got a few slides at the end about the other specs, but query is I think where you know uh, where we're at right now. You know the continue on for Sparkle one zero, which was only query. So this is what I'll cover, and then we can talk about you know update or the other things later on. So these are the new features in Sparkle 1.1 one, one query. You can project expressions, aggregates, negation, property paths, subqueries, and a whole ton of new functions. Um, a lot of these were obviously needed very early on. Right? People have been screaming they wanted negation you know, since before Sparkle 1.0 was a standard. Um, and some of these things were possible like negation, but they were really hard. So this is you know, standardized all of these, and I'm going to give you some examples of, of all of these. So project expressions uh, allow you to put an expression in the select clause where before you just had a variable. So say your data has you know, uh, information about algebraic expressions, and you want to say, OK, this expression uh, you know, is a sum operation. It's got two arguments. right? Um, I want to select out the sum of those two values and return it as z. So this query returns uh, a, single, a table with a single column, z, which is the sum of those two values. All right. Um, you can also do functions here. Uh, this is one of the new functions, string concatenation. Right? So you can say, um, I want to match all the people and their first names and last names, but I want to return the people with their full name. Right? So we're going to concatenate their first name and a space and their last name and stuff that into a variable called name. And this will return right, P and name. So. Uh, uh, from the last two slides, hopefully you can see, right, the syntax for this, you've got some expression here, always inside of these parens, 
and then as a name. So you've always got to give it a name that you uh, are going to return as. Uh, this is a little different from SQL, where you can just give it you know, no name, and the column will be the expression, right? So you do, um, you do you know, select concat, whatever, and then your column would be concat. You know, it would be this chunk right here. It's probably you've always got to give it a name. All right, so aggregates, this is another thing that, that I think everyone has wanted for a long time. You use the aggregates supported in 1.1. You can do counting, a couple different uh, variations on counting. Uh, basically, I think the same variations as SQL. You can do sum, minimum, maximum, average, group concat. This is a MySQL thing, uh, which allows you to do concatenation within an aggregated group. And sample. So I'll give examples of all of these real quick. I'm in your way here, John. <laughs> all right. So the most kind of simple example here, right? I would say match all the people and count them. Right? How many people are in this data set? And assign it to count, and you're going to get back some, you know, integer value of how many people are in your data set. Uh, if you uh, kind of jump around here, but uh, sample says uh, I don't care which one from the group you give me, just give me back one. Right. So if you match all the email addresses of me. Right, you may get back one email address here, you may get back 10, you don't know. So you're saying, just give me back one of them. I don't care which one. And return it in email. So, so it's not, it's just a little sample, it's just email. No, right, yeah, just, just give me back, back any one. And there's no, it's, it's not, not defined, defined like which one, right? It may be the first one, it may be, you know, some like randomly picked one, don't know. It's where you don't care, right? Like I said, group concat uh, allows you to concatenate within a group. Uh, this separator part is optional, but here we're saying, right, we're going to match those email addresses again, and we may get back one, we may get back ten, and concatenate them with, you know, separated by a comma. So you'll get back a list here of all my email addresses, comma separated. Right. So what was the choice of having a semicolon as a delimiter here for the arguments versus a comma in the, like, the filter functions? Um. Right. So, so comma in these aggregates, there are aggregates that take multiple arguments, and this isn't an argument to uh, group concat, it's an argument to uh, the aggregate handler, I mean, if, they, if that makes sense. Right. So if you put a comma here, you, uh, well, for one thing, let me just say this. I don't want to get dragged into this discussion now. We can discuss it uh, later on if you're really interested. Suffice to say that the semantics, if you put a comma, uh, wouldn't be as clear. Like, it, it wouldn't be as clear, like, what to do with that. Especially since we don't have named arguments like this uh, in this kind of function-looking syntax in general, right? So we needed a new syntax to give it this named argument thing that's separate from the aggregate uh, arguments. I don't know if that's totally convincing, but <laughs> yeah. Can you use group and cat with order by to, to order the uh, no. result? <laughs> um, I, I, know I know there's desire design. for this. I, I think, think this is another thing that uh, will probably, probably, you know, people, people will be wanting until the next go around on standardization. <laughs> um, this is something that just didn't, didn't make the cut. So no, you can't. So these don't work order by. Like Right. I mean, they work like aggregates. Right. So they look like functions, but it's really, you know, take the groups you get back from uh, matching and all of the values. So, you know, it's basically a column from the results of the graph pattern uh, pass as a set to your aggregate, and those all get collapsed in some way, either concatenation or sum or average or something. Right. So instead of a function, which is going to be, would be like a row of values, right, this takes a group think of as the column. So, so there's, there's also grouping. Um, right? Up until this point, all of our aggregates have worked on the implicit group of everything that comes out of the graph pattern. Here we're going to uh, partition those into groups by saying, find all the, the people uh, that have email addresses group by person. So split up the results. You know, you've got one kind of bucket for each person, right? All the email addresses uh, are in one bucket per person, and then count the number of email addresses in each one of those. All right, so we're going to say, give me back the people and the number of email addresses they have, and I'm only interested in the ones where they have more than one email address. 
Right? So having just a filter that works after aggregation has happened. So again, this is very similar to SQL, so hopefully there's some common ground for people to, to get this on. So aggregates, good, any more questions? All right. Uh, negation, this is the big one. Uh, so big, in fact, that we ended up with two different forms of negation that are slightly different. And I'm not going to get into the difference because it's, uh, in most cases, it'll work the same. Uh, we can get into it at the end if people are really interested. But minus and not exist are the two. Uh, so here's an example of, of minus form. Say, give me back all the people uh, that don't have a school homepage of rpi.edu. Right? So all the, the people in the database where you can't find this assertion for them. Right? So intuitively, I think this probably makes sense to everyone. Right? Um, the details of how it works uh, are important when you want to do the same thing with a not exist, which looks almost exactly the same, right? We say, add all the people, filter not exists, the folks school homepage, rpi.edu. In this example, these will return exactly the same results. Um, the, in the first case, uh, it works by, it, it's a, the minus is a graph, op, uh, a graph pattern, works as a binary operator. This goes row by row through the results of that first part and checks uh, for each one. So, so those are going to result in slightly different semantics, but in this case, exactly the same. So in this case, is the same thing as doing an optional deep of school homepage. Yeah, yeah, the <laughs> optional <laughs> not boundary. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and then filtering out the doing, uh, yes. not, or not is, yeah. is like. Yes, so, so hopefully you'll agree, much better syntax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was another? Uh, I guess, is there any kind of, kind of quick explanation of what the difference is the, the semantics between the uh, filter not exists and the minus. Sure. So, so, so this one, like I said, right? I mean, it acts just like filtering in general, which yeah. is you take all the results from this first part and row by row, you kind of swap out the variables for the values, right? So, say you get a row where p is is me or I for me, right? So you're going to say, then for each one of those, replace p here with Greg, and you say, does the triple Greg? School homepage rpi.edu exist in the database? Mm -hmm. If yes, ditch the result. Right? If no, keep it. Uh, the other one, let's go back here. All right. So this one will match all the results for this. Right? You get a whole big list of results. And then for the minus, completely separately, match all of the results for that pattern. Right? So all of the school homepage triples. And for every result over here, check it if it, if it exists over here. And if it does, throw it out. If not, keep it and then return just these. Yeah. Right? And so, are there cases this is, that it wouldn't be the same? Or yes, there, there are, are cases. cases. Um, and uh, I mean, I don't expect people are going to run into them all that often. So, for example, uh, if you just had a triple pattern here, just like no variables, it was just a triple, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you match this. It will return, and that triple exists in the database, right? This will return a row, one result with no variable bindings. Right? It's one row, no columns, right? Uh, and so um, I don't want to get into all the, you know, the specifics of this. Um, this is like a weird case for this, right? Because you, I mean, that in uh, not exists, it, well, you're going to say, does it exist? Yes. Ditch the result. Over here, there's a condition on minus that says there has to be a shared variable between these. Otherwise, it's nonsensical, right? Where getting all these, right? Getting back all the people where, you know, minus all the products, and all of a sudden you're left with no results because they would join, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so there's this condition where it says there has to be a shared variable between them. There are other examples, um, you know, more. I'm sure more interesting to the people who care about this um, that I don't, you know, have with me right now. But they're, they're subtly different, but for the vast majority of cases, they're the same. In fact, I don't think the standard, uh, the spec document tells you how they're different, right? Because no one wants to go through the, the burden of, like, proving exactly how they're different, right? So do you feel one is easier to not screw up than the other? Empirically, it, it seems that Everyone I've met intuitively understands one or the other much 
more than the, the other five. Right? And so whichever of these makes more sense to you, you should use that one. And when you run into a problem, maybe, right, hopefully not, in that tiny set of things where these, you know, there's this overlap, then go digging around for more details. But well, one of these is probably makes a lot more sense to you, use that one. Is, uh, is there any vast difference in, in performance in this? Is that too much for the implementation? Depends on the implementation. Uh, I can tell you that for some uh, four store, minus is vastly more efficient. Um, and in fact, general rule of thumb may be that minus is more efficient because filter has to go through, do an operation for each row here, whereas the minus form you can do, you know, in bulk, do the two matchings and then just you know, join. But it's implementation. I don't want to, you know, say that that's going to hold up for any. Thing. So, RDF has, uh, this is another thing I think that there's been a lot of interest in. RDF is a graph, right? But we've got this query language that up until now hasn't really given you the expressivity to you know, do interesting graph queries, right? So, this is the first thing that allows you to do arbitrary length data matching. So, here's you know, the social network query, right? So, starting with me, find all the people that I know and the people they know and the people they know all the way as far as you can go, getting back their names. Right. So, so get the whole days. Obviously, this may be a very expensive operation, right? But I mean, that that's up to you if you're running this, right? So, right. So this should look familiar if you're familiar with you know regular expressions or something. Just putting a plus on the end there says match both nodes one or more times, right? As far out as you can go until you don't have any more matches. Is there any way to control that, or are they able to know which rings of which are coming back from? So something like this, it'd be great to know like the whole network, but does it mean any good if I don't know their place in the, the depth of how far it is? Like There's no way, way to find out the length of the path. Mm -hmm. This was some, another thing that just didn't make the cut. Yeah. Um, there are other, just, just like regular expressions, right? instead of plus, you can say, you know, in braces, you could say one comma four. So up to, you know, one to four levels of both mm -hmm. nodes. You can do that. Where there's a whole a whole syntax of how you can do this, okay. and then you can build them up, right? So in this case, if we don't care about what those you know the resources that represent the people are, we just want to know names. Just do it, right? Slash is how you join these together. So you say a whole social network, and then do, add on a, a name, you know, edge right at the end there, and just give me back all the names. So there's a whole syntax here, right? Plus star. You can do the braces on. Um, Bounded length matching. You can do uh, inverses, so you could basically swap the subject and object if your you know query you know demands that. Um, so you can build up fairly complex things here. Um, I found that that once you get too complex, it's really hard to figure out what the query is doing. So I tend to shy away from these like you know, monstrously complex things because for a lot of these, right, this is, is uh, equivalent to. Well, so if I wasn't projecting P, right, this would be equivalent to this if I'm just interested in the names. Um, but as you get more and more complex, you might start preferring them where it's, you know, a little more explicit. So who supports RDF? I don't think so. The, the, yeah, they've got, yeah. Um, this is something that the working group is soliciting is, is uh, implementation reports. I can tell you ARC and my implementation, RDF query, uh, are the only two known that are basically 100% feature complete. Um, other than that, uh, there are other implementations for any, any given feature, but I don't know of any that are feature complete for all of them. So I'm pretty sure other people support property paths. Couldn't give you a list right now, other than those two. Back on that previous slide. Um, what is that, what's that result actually going to look like? Uh, well, it's just going to be uh, rows of one column. Right. Column's going to be name and okay. names of all the people that you can reach through. You know, my social network. Starting with me, can you traverse edges, both those edges? Okay, uh, so so we're not going to include you, but it's going to include the first that you know in that chain or in that path. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and there are. I don't want to get too into specifics, right? The algorithm here uh, avoids uh, loops, for example, um, uh, as far as the cardinality goes right there. I mean, you can look in the document how it does um, 
these stop conditions when it's traversing the graph. Right? At some point, if it's seen the data before uh, it stops, it doesn't, you know, you, you'll always get a, a fixed result, right? Uh, an infinite result set. But um, you could do some interesting things like this but with, you could put a, like a count up above in the select. Uh, no, <laughs> I don't think so because the, uh, the, or, the, the order of the results here is undefined. So, uh, you know, it may go 30 levels deep and then the first 10 you see may be the ones that are 30 levels deep, right? Like I said, it, getting, being able to access the length of the path that matched is something that just didn't make the cut. Oh, and so uh, that would be cool, but not yet. Right. Maybe in, in the next round, or, I mean, if it's something people want, implementation so will do it. Right? Just to be precise, it, it would give an unexpected result, not a, right? it might give a nonsensical result, but it not, wouldn't necessarily arc. Is that correct? If I, if I, if I wanted to sort of count up. If you. If, if, it, if I wanted to, if I tried to, if, if in my select, I tried to do a count. Oh, if you just do a count right here, it'll tell you. Uh, all of the, as many people with names that it can find that are in your social network. That would, that would work fine. Oh, it's just when you want to do the limiting on up to the, you know, 10 oh, people right, or something, yeah. you couldn't do that. Oh yeah, no, the counting will work fine. So, uh, what, hold on, Kevin. So after the plus, the, the slash, you know, quote name is name, does that operate the same as an as, uh, in a, in a select, you know, select this as that. I mean, is that what's going on here? Uh, no, so this, uh, so back up one. Did, did you understand this? Yeah, I'm good right there. I'm good up to the, pl the plus, I'm good. Right. right, so all this is saying is, if you don't care about this B, um, on this path, uh, it'd be just like a regular expression where you just add some new character on the end. Slash is how you're going to represent that. So uh, this is the path, right? It's going to be any number of both nodes and then a both name. Oh, so I see. Nothing, so you get something so, to do with a variable. So, like in regex, to keep with that analogy, you, it's like adding multiple classes in a regex. Uh, it, it would just be concatenation, right? So, well, I mean, I mean, because this is a graph, it's a little different than a regular expression, right? Right. But it's basically the same. <laughs> if you have right, a is your nose, mm -hmm. and then, you know, name, that's, that's going to be your end of the expression, right? right. right. Whereas the previous right. word was just that, right? So, so it's just slapping on another thing that you want to match on the path. Oh, I, okay, I got you. So it's not a matching little, I got you. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right, so subqueries. Well, oh, so, yeah, I just sorry. Want, so I just want to make sure I understand this. So if I put in um, RDF rest and RDF first in there, I should be able to yes. traverse. <laughs> yes, <laughs> actually. Only. So, Right, but, and here's the but, uh, it allows you to access elements of a list like that, but it doesn't allow you to get them back in order. Oh. Right? <laughs> it gives you just enough to like get the data, but you have no idea what the order was. And the problem here is that to get the order would require ch changing the fundamental semantics of Sparkle, which was, I mean, to established at this point to set, right? The intermediate results aren't ordered. Ordering only happens at the end, and by that point, you've lost the context of how it matched. So, yes, I mean, this is exactly, right, I mean, everyone wants that, right? And because Sparkle up to this point, right, you, you couldn't do it, these arbitrary length, you know, lists. And so this will allow you to pull that out, but there's no way to get the order. Uh, so if you had a tree that had all sorts of stuff in it, and you wanted to get to get a node in the tree, and then you wanted to say get everything that's below it. Sure. Yeah. Um, you but then you'd, you'd, you'd also be able to get the links between those. You use a construct at least. Yeah, and and this is how right. I mean, either it's baked into the API, or you do something like a construct and reconstruct it on the other end. But I mean, that's what you do in one o, right? So one one just gives you the ability to pull out all the elements if you don't care about the ordering. But you're still going to have to resort to that sort of, you know, client side or baked into the API stuff if you want the order. There's no way around that. So, is there any thought to do ordering at some point in Sparkle, some version? 
I don't know. Like I said, I mean, this was, was discussed a lot, and the problem is to do that it would require fundamental changes to the language. And, and right, I mean, it's already a standard. Doing that would almost require you to create just a new language. So you're in the one one working group now. So one one isn't a recommendation yet. Not yet. But you it's getting close. Yeah. Okay. So you can basically predict what's going to be in it at yeah. this point. Yeah. I mean, it's in last call. We're going to go through another round of last calls, but uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, nothing, nothing like that. that. I mean, that's a huge change. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't hold my breath for that. Good. Anyone else? All right. So okay. sub queries. Uh, just let you stop. An entire query, select query, uh, inside another query, right? So the, the big example here is limiting by a resource. So say you've got a database of articles published on a website, right? And you want to get back the articles uh, and the authors for that article for the last 10 articles, right? Problem is, if you don't know how many authors each article has, you can't do just a, a limit uh, on a normal query because the first article might have 10 authors, and now you've only got back data for one article, right? So the way to do this is, in the in inner query, right, the subquery here, you're going to select the 10 articles, right? So give me back S, where S is an article, and it has some creation date. We're going to order by date and limit 10. So this gets us the most recent 10 articles, right? And then we're going to join that. So that's just a graph pattern, right? We've taken that query, turned it into a graph pattern and then join it with the creators for that uh, article. And you'll, you will get, assuming there were 10 articles in the database, you will get back at least 10 results here, uh, and maybe more, depending on how many authors they had, right? You'll get back the number of articles times the number of authors, right? Does that make sense, everyone? All right, good. All right, we're, we're coming up to the end here, uh, except this is enormous, right? <laughs> so all the other, all the functions in Sparkle One Zero could fit on one page, right? I showed that earlier. There are a ton of new functions in One One. I'm going to kind of try to breeze through them here. Uh, and hopefully, we'll you know get through them as fast as we can. There are numeric functions. We're dealing with numeric data. You get the absolute value, ceiling, floor, a random number between zero and one. You can round a number, and you can test if a number is a literal is numeric, right? So this is there are some built-in numeric types that Sparkle understands. Integer, decimal, double, right? This will tell you, is it one of those? So uh, all of these come from the uh, XML schema data types functions, right? So if you're familiar with those, that's this. If you're not, I assume everyone understands, right? I mean, absolute value, ceiling, floor, right? If you've programmed, you should understand all of these. So good with those. Date functions, a huge number of date functions. Uh, date time. Uh, Sparkle has an understanding of date times, right? You, you could order by them before. It could tell you what was you know, less than greater than. Now you can pull out information from them. Uh, now we'll give you back a date time that represents the time of the query execution. And then all of the rest of these help you, let you extract data from a date time. So you can get back the year, month, day, hours, minutes. Those are all integers. And in fact, if you're using like the canonical uh, lexical form of date time. This is just basically a substring operation, right? So your date time starts with, you know, 2011 dash. Only year on that date time just returns 2011 as the integer, right? Uh, seconds is a decimal because it can, you know, they're not integral seconds. And then there are two time zone functions. Uh, the naming here is less than ideal. Uh, there's time zone and TZ. They differ in what the result looks like. One is an XSD duration, which is this crazy you know, duration syntax, negative P, T, 5, H, which is five hours behind Greenwich mean, or T, Z, which gives you much more recognizable, right, just offsets, either Z or, you know, minus five, which is, you know, the, the offset of, you know, from Greenwich mean. So, depending on, you know, what you want to do with those. Nothing to convert to and from UTF. I'd like to change UTC? UTC, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, no. Um, one issue here is that Sparkle doesn't necessitate that uh, a system um, deal with different time zones. So it's acceptable for a system to normalize all the times coming in, which is going to make you annoyed if you want to pull out these lexical values. But so standardizing that would have forced you know a lot of a lot of extra code. Is there a way to 
Oh, it's got a, um, a date time, but it's, it's a little I need to cast it to a date time. Yes. And we'll get to that in two slides. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> hash functions. So you can have hash literal values using MD5 or SHA-1 or three variants of SHA-2. Hopefully everyone, you know, that doesn't need a lot of explanation. Uh, string functions. I'm sorry, three slides. <laughs> uh, hopefully most of these are, just like the numeric ones, fairly intuitive. You can concatenate an arbitrary length list of, you know, strings. Uh, you can test whether one string contains another. In code for URI, will escape characters that, uh, for, uh, you know, URL escaping, if you need to create a URI out of it. You can lowercase and uppercase. You can replace matches of a pattern with a string. Uh, you can get uh, substrings that are either before or after a string. You can get the string length in characters, uh, so Unicode, you know, graphemes. Um, you can get, you can test whether a string starts with or ends with a string, and you can get a substring. And to everyone's frustration, I'm sure, substring is one based, not zero based. But XSE does it, and so we're stuck with it. And constructor functions. So this is where you can create a data type thing. Um, so you would just you know pass in your string with the data type and pass in uh, you know date, the XSD date time URI. Uh, you can create blank nodes. Uh, if you don't call it an argument, it creates a new blank node every time. If you pass in a literal, this will be a blank node unique to that literal within the Gory execution. So this is useful when you want to do a construct Gory, create a new graph, and you want to create new nodes for things to hang off of. Right? So a new node for each person based on their name. You can cast things into resources, just like is IR and is URI. There are two of these, but they're exactly the same function. Uh, and then you can create the language tag literals. So hopefully those are obvious. And then the last slide here on the functions. These aren't really functions, but they look like functions, or these are function-like things. Greg, could you go back one? Yep. Um, I just, so the one that sort of answered my question, okay. Um, does, does it assume that the, the value you're passing in is formatted um, this, uh, in a way you know, that matches that, that data type literal model? Uh, I believe implementations it's up to the implementations whether they support invalid lexical forms for data types. So if you pass in, you know, the letter A and said it's a date time, some systems would produce that. Others would say that's not a date time and throw an error. So, right. And that's up to the, and that exists already, right, when you, um, like, on, when you just import data, right? Some systems are going to stop you and say you got invalid data typed literals and some will be totally happy doing that. Right. So it's up to the implementation. So you have to do some sort of Processing on that value, on that literal, and then do the get in right one, and then do the. Data. If the data in the database isn't valid, lexically valid, yes. Hopefully, you've been, you know, cleansing your data on import, and this won't be a problem for you. <laughs> um, or your system doesn't allow it. In. Right, the system does it for you. Uh, so these are you know, the function like things. Couple less, uh, an arbitrary number of arguments. Variants are expressions, and this is going to return uh, the value from evaluating the expressions, and it will return the first one that doesn't result in an error. So if the first one results in a divide by zero, and the second one returns an unbound value, and the third one returns the string hello, this will return hello, right? So this allows you to do, you know, like division or, uh, you know, if you've got a query that has an option and you're not sure if the variable is going to be bound, this allows you to provide default values so the full query doesn't <coughs> blow up with a, you know, an evaluation error. Uh, if, right, this should be obvious, right, if the first expression evaluates to true, it will return the result of value with the second thing, otherwise the third thing. Not exists, we've been over this, right? The, um, it, it's, this is basically a function, but syntactically it's different because it takes a graph pattern and it returns a Boolean. Uh, you can do exists. Uh, you don't have to have the not here. Um, you might as well just do the graph pattern, right? But this will allow you to, to match it without binding new variables. 
and bind. This is actually a graph pattern, um, but you give it an expression and you can assign that thing, you can bind that value to a new variable. So this is just like a select expression, but inside the graph pattern. All right, so this is helpful if you've got a bunch of union blocks and you want to know where the data came from, which union block, you can create a new variable and bind a value to it, right? Say, assign the integer one for the first block and two for the second, and then once you get the results out, you can say, ah, oh, the data came from this branch of the query, right? It came from you know, this other place. So that's useful. Um, Yes, but that will be a new blank node for every query result that comes out of the graph pattern. So if you've got multiple rows from your where clause that talk about the same person, that blank node is going to be different. You're going to get two of them on the, in the construct, whereas this would allow you to merge those into a single one. All right, so uh, that's it for Spark 101 query. It's just a few more slides. Uh, 101 update, happy to get into it. These are the basic operations. This has been around for a long time. It's just now being standardized. It allows you to insert and delete data, do conditional deletes and inserts based on what's already in the graph. You can load data uh, from a URL. You can clear a graph, create and drop graphs, whatever. Hopefully that's clear. Uh, is the, the standard for the update, uh, is that including the entire protocol of how it's working, including any type of uh, say I want like some, uh, I want to just, only some authorized people just to pick my data. I mean, there's a lot of authorization, uh, authentication. All that's all separate. Just, just like Sparkle One. Oh, right. I mean, obviously now you've got update. Yeah. So it's you know. Because right, you can always do it through the HTTP headers for authentication. Right? Oh, that's true. Kind of that's true. Authenticate. Right. Yeah. This is a separate. This, this is, is orthogonal to the language. Ah, uh, understood. So. Understood. Okay. And along the same lines, does it avoid collisions and is it stable or is it just? So if sure. one person's doing an update and one person's doing a select in the same, is it atomic, I guess, is the question. The yeah. spec says it should be atomic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. and, and this is in the, the RFC whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, should has like normative text that goes along with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That implementations, like it should means implementations, you know, better do it that way unless they have a very good reason not to. Right, right. Right. And so the reason it should and not must is there are a lot of implementations like mine uh, that are, you know, kind of, I don't want to say toy implementations, but are not meant to be industrial grade, right? And, and forcing atomicity on them would be a big burden on the implementation. So, so the spec says, yes, it should do that, but check with your implementation. Uh, and then these are the other specs in Sparkle 1.1. A uh, protocol tells you how to interact with Sparkle over HTTP. Entailment tells you what query matching over RDF uh, in the presence of some entailment, RDFS entailment, L entailment, whatever, what that means. Uh, graph storage HTTP protocol lets you deal with named graphs uh, as a whole, so you can use HTTP verbs on them. So you could do a HTTP put on a whole graph and send it an RDF file and replace that graph, right? Things like that. Service description. Uh, this is my work. This allows an endpoint to tell you things about it. So what functions it supports, uh, statistics about its data set, things like that. And then there are some new formats for results from Sparkle uh, instead of just XML. So now you can get them in JSON, CSV, or TSV. So that's it for the slides. Um, uh, I mean, I actually went an hour with that, but, uh, you know, I'm happy to, I've got, some like demo data to play with, or I'd be much happier playing with anyone's data or talking more about queries. So, open it up to you. I just had a kind of a quick question on some of the protocol and the, the graph storage. Could you, could you describe a little more about what it actually entails, or, or some of the ideas behind it, or what you could Sure. Expect? So, the protocol, this one, mm -hmm. uh, is just like the Sparkle protocol from one zero. Okay. It's, it describes how you interact with Sparkle, how you submit a query over HTTP. So this is, you know, if you've got an endpoint at example.com slash Sparkle, this tells you you've got a query, you're gonna URL encode it, and do example.com slash Sparkle question mark query equals that thing, right? That's all that does. And this is now extended to support update as well. Right? So but that's basically 
just as it was in one and zero. Uh, this one is right, the new one here, uh, and it, I mean, all of this I think is fairly intuitive based on the relevant technologies, but basically it's saying there is some RDF data set on some server, right, identified by a URL, uh, actually the graphs it contains are identified by some URL, and you want to interact with it using HTTP verbs. So Get, it's kind of like put, a post, way of delete. Yes. Stuff like yeah. That. yeah. Okay. Right. And, and so, so it, it should fall out pretty much from an understanding of REST mm -hmm. and an understanding of RDF data sets. Yeah. But it's basically just making that concrete in a spec, yeah. saying you can now put to uh, a URL and send an RDF file, and it will take those triples and put them in the named graph of that URL. Right. You can delete a named graph by sending it delete, whatever. And that's actually that's part of the one one specs completely, or that kind of separate or side to the. It is one of the Sparkle 1.1 one one specs. So if something says it's 1.1, one one, then it has to support that type of thing as well then, or is that? No. no. So, so the, the, there, there are, there will be compliance for each of these, right? Uh, compliance for Sparkle 1.1 one one query, update, uh, protocol's a little weird since, I mean, it, it's almost trivial to support, but uh, entailment, graph storage should be protocol. Service description is pretty much paired with protocol. You can't have the service description without protocol. Uh, as far as its conformance, it also is basically just a vocabulary, and you can use that without supporting it. But and then these two conformance is obvious, right? But for the the big ones, for query update, entailment, and the HTTP protocol, conformance will be for each one of them. Each one of those. Actually, you know what? There's one missing here. It's basic federated query. So the service keyword, which a bunch of you know implementations already support this virtuoso arc, what whatever. Um, so this is just standardizing that you can tell the name of an endpoint and give it a graph pattern and though the results for that graph pattern will come from that endpoint. Have there been any implementations of the graph store HTTP protocol yet or is that still? Uh, I believe uh, ARC supports it. So this is Fuseki, mm -hmm. um, the, I don't know if it's a <laughs> successor to Joseki, but in the same line. Mm -hmm. right. Seems like very, seems like the graph version of what now. Yes, it's probably a fair yeah. comparison. You know, but you know, always sending or sending or retrieving RDF. Right, but and then to to graph and the URIs are yeah. in graphs. Yeah. Which yeah. uh, It's its own. So this isn't for RDF. This is for select results. So this is so just like the Sparkle uh, XML results format. It's basically just that in JSON. So, tabular data where the cells are RDF terms. Is it like the same as you like in Virtuoso and some of the other ones, or is it a new standard? It was an existing spec, mm -hmm. so well, an existing right, proposal mm -hmm. that was was implemented. Um, so yeah, there's already support for this out there. Um, so no, it's not for the RDF. It's not for construct or describe. There are so many options when you move to that side. Uh, so that's not standardizing any of that. Anyone else? All right. We can just do some demos or? Does anybody have um, your any tech questions? questions or, you know, this is sort of, at this point, it's, it, it was meant to be sort of an all commerce thing. If you've got like, a specific problem um, that you're working on or you want to challenge for it, this is my recommendation to you, you know, if anyone's leaving now. Fuseki is the easiest way to play around with this. There's the link. You can just Google it. You'll be good to go in a couple minutes. So nobody's got any Sparkle problems. Sparkle problem. experts, everyone. Yeah, everyone's, everyone's, everything there is. Everyone's, everybody's Sparkle queries are working. So, oh, man. Could you show us some property path demos? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so, I just have Buseki running here. I loaded a data set from our uh, LogD project. It's the politically dicey but fun to play with. Uh, it's a data set of nuclear reactors. 
Uh, we can't do this, you know, with any of our public demos because no one wants that data around. Yeah. Oh, God, the out. Yeah. Um, but so I loaded that into Fuseki. So, you know, it's a two-line thing to get it running and load the data. So um, we just play around with it. Uh, well, so you wanted property paths, but I was going to kind of ease into this by uh, kind of poking around the data, seeing what there is. So, so if you're playing along at home, this is data. This is the what data set five nine fifty seven. Uh, nine fifty seven, I think. Nine fifty seven. Uh, it's up, but. <laughs> So, if we want to see, it's kind of uh, what the types of things are in this database. It's kind of you know the first query I always run to see what's there. You see, there's a lot of, of kind of extra stuff besides the, the core data here. There's provenance and metadata, whatever. But it's about nuclear reactors and plant unit. Uh, I know is the the core of this. So let's grab that and say. Prefix this. So we can use that later. And say we want all of the reactors. All right. Oops. What do I do? Yep. <laughs> Star. So, so here's a list of all the reactors in the country. And there's probably, I don't know. So some of these, these are, are, are units. I think sometimes there's more than one unit per site. Uh, but one unit, right, so these are basically reactors. So you, know, you can have four reactors on the site or whatever. Right, so, yeah. Well, they had, they had what, six? They had like six, yeah. So, uh, the next thing I always do is, well, what properties are there on those things? So you can just go back there and just talk through that. This yeah. Is a sanity check. Yeah, so, um, is this big enough for everyone? Uh, so, you know, I'm selecting all the things of type plant unit, uh, and the syntax here is probably, you know, not helping. But So, and then basically just, you know, any predicate and any object hanging off of, of a reactor, and I'm saying, give me all of those predicates, I want to see what they are. In addition, I know that these predicates have RDFS labels, and what's that? <laughs> Well, is the only one I got <laughs> stuck in my head. I forgot that's Jesse. So, uh, oh, wait, hold on. So, give me back all of the properties and the naming here to be better, but then all of the labels, right? It's just so we have a friendly thing to look at. And we've got to make that a little smaller now. So, these are all the properties on the reactors, right? Architect, engineer, commercial operation, permit issued, it's a date. Constructor, license megawatts, uh, licensee location. All right, so all you can see all of these. Um, so we want to find those GE reactors. Now. All right, so type is going to be. Let's see, where's reactor and containment type? Is the one we really are interested in here, right? So let's grab that and say instead of all this, you know, let's make another prefix because that's huge. And then we'll say all the plants with a reactor and containment type of type. Get rid of the ordering. Oh, 
and I, you know what, let's not do this. I know this also has an RDFS label. So now we get all the types. So that actually, the RDFS label didn't actually help us all that much. But these are the types of these things, right? So uh, this is a boiling water reactor mark one. This is a Fukushima reactor type, right? So uh, it actually say, okay, well, that might be a, a dangerous thing, right? So let's say, uh, let's count them uh, by type, All right? How many of those do we have in this country? And what is my react mark one? There are 23 of them, right? The biggest one is this, uh, I don't know what that stands for, right? So hopefully some, you know, safer uh, type. <laughs> but so, right, there, there are these six types, right? There are these three for the mark one, through Mark III of the Leather Hunter Reactor, and then uh, these other types. But so there's the aggregation. Um, if we wanted to, uh, this data set isn't great for, for arbitrary length property paths, but we could already do a property path like this, and we'll get the same results, right? So just tacking, a, tacking two predicates together with a slash, because we don't care about the thing in the middle that's connecting them. Um, I should have thought about that. All right, so this, this data set is terrible for property paths because it's not graph-like. It started out as a table of data, so, um, yeah. I just have a real basic question on the first prefix. Yep. I didn't, oh, I'm sorry, not the Third one? first one. The first, yeah, that one. The missing? Yeah, yeah so you don't have to have uh, a name to it. It can be the empty prefix, in which case, you don't have to put something at the start of the... the oh, so you can do that once. You can only do it once. Yeah, right? okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. the thing before the colon has to be unique, whether it's empty or sure. it has characters. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so, this is all guy. Well, there's only one of them, right? Yeah. He wants to know. Actually, yeah. So, what do you want to know about? The Vermont reactor PO shows me there's no out that. Or just sorry. Yeah. So, let's get rid of our aggregate, and we can search for Vermont again. And here's the URI of our Vermont reactor. And let's go back, and now we want... That P O. Oh, all right. Yeah, so that's going to get us. You're going to be doing a lot of those. <laughs> so, this is all the properties about that. And so, you know what? Hold on. So, let's see, the operating license was issued in 73. A lot of these are, you see, right, these are a lot of uh, URIs that have further information beyond them, so you go, you know, track this down, what, what properties hang off, you know, GE4 as the design type. Um, all right, but this is obviously erroneous data. I mean, Vermont Yankee is the name of it, but this is not a web page, this is the name. Um, so we have license megawatts is, Almost what, two gigawatts. Uh, operating license expires yeah. in a few months. So that works out. Yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't say that. So, okay. so I had a few more here using some of the other, mostly aggregates. Let me just paste one of these in here. Let's see if we can do that. So uh, this one's using group compat, right? This is an aggregate to concatenate. So here we're saying uh, you got all the reactors, their type and their location, group by type and concatenate the location. So for, for each type, give me a list of the locations for reactors of that type. All right. Unfortunately, the location strings are kind of bulky here, but so here's this 
this Mark One, right, that we looked at before, here are all the places it is in this country, right? Wheeler Lake, Alabama, Park River, New Jersey, right? A huge list of it. Um, and so we're, uh, unfortunately, this data set doesn't have just you know that name uh, by itself, but um, it's a, right, yeah. I mean, well, I don't know that Fusaki has some of those, those string functions. Just to the oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> But saying we don't control the data, right? <laughs> we're, we're on the query side of things here. So, so this particular, these particular results that are coming back, there's some really, you know, they, they have a consistent, somewhat bogus, but consistent way of, of giving a location. Yep. It's always, you know, some, some miles, some direction yep. of some known thing. Yep. Is there ways that we can, I over did something. In the language, Spark 1.1, yes. Unfortunately, some of the string functions were just agreed to like last week. I'm pretty sure Fuseki doesn't have them. So, for example, so, so uh, you would use uh, stir before and stir after to like take out the things in the parentheticals, right? You just wanted the 10 and the southwest, right? So you could get 10 miles southwest, and then you could do you could start doing some some kind of mixed up with that, and you know, so you could pull those out, but I don't think Fuseki supports that yeah. right now. So there, there's a limited amount you could pull out there, but in general, you might need to resort to pulling it out and kind of playing with it and re-importing it. Um, the data does, I think, have latitude and longitude, which avoids the whole ten miles southwest thing. You could just grab latitude and longitude. Does it? I think the garage. I thought it does. Maybe not. Okay. I don't think it does. Well, I, well, so, so I think the world world play games with the if, it, if it has it, I suspect we added that in a uh, you know merging right. of where is yeah. you know this place and we link that with geo names or something. The world world's listening right now. He's probably yeah. so. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, all of this seems pretty. You did a double secret demo that uses in a really nice and scary way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we could do. <laughs> so, if we want to say uh, all of those results except those boiling water reactor Mark One, um, we could do. Well, let me get that. So we could do. No, yeah, we could do. Well, yeah. All of these are, are in Wikipedia. Yeah, of course they are. Yeah, that'd be the easy one to do. So now we've screwed out the Mark 1 results. <laughs> yeah, we're just checking that. Just 2 and 3. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, yeah, the Latin lot are in the. Are they are in here? Yeah. Yeah, they're in Wikipedia as well. Yeah. No, there's no Latin lot. Oh, in the data set. Oh, no, they're in Wikipedia. That's why I'm checking it. Yeah, right. Right. Okay. yeah. Um, so, so this is. They also have photos of the. They also have photos of the reactors, too, I think. Like you look at the problem with the Pope uh, fiction? I, I'm a little yeah. bit slow, but it looked, it, it looked like there was photos, yeah. 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 Okay, so, so sorry. here I just served out all the reactors of type, you know, that, that Mark 1 we were looking at. And it's using a minus, you know, based on the reactor you were on here. Um, instead, if we wanted to say, well, you know, forget about matching that. We just want to get rid of all the records where type is that BWR string. I'm gonna. Uh, I have no idea if this is gonna work. I, there were some bugs in Fuseki at one point about this, but we can try just saying, well, minus the the result where type is BWR Mark One. Let's see if that works. Yes, and there two and three, no one. So we're not actually matching any data there. We're saying minus this constant, or minus just where type is BWR Mark One. Uh, oops. So, I mean, kind of gone over all the features. Uh, this isn't great for the one thing that was asked for. <laughs> but so, right, I mean, we've done some, some aggregation and some creation. Uh, we could try to do. I mean, 
try to see what functions exist in here. Uh, and this now doesn't even make, you know, not a lot of sense. Well, I guess that doesn't, isn't implemented yet. <laughs> I, I don't think this is the most recent version, so don't let this sway your opinion. <laughs> Who's that here? Just as a reminder, so we're currently using virtual, so whatever. Um, what, what version of Sparkle do we have? We they have some of these things. So I know like a lot of the aggregate stuff is in virtual, so we can try to use those. Yeah. Your syntax uh, is more lenient than Sparkle 1.1, 1 .1, 1, but Virtual just supports this syntax. They don't support all of the aggregates. I don't think they support group and cat. No, they don't think um, they support. But they'll support the big ones, right? Yeah. Sum, count, average, average min, min, max. You don't have like um, minus or any of the other stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. think they have negation. Yeah. They don't have property pads per se. They have some syntactic shorthands for doing kind of doing property paths uh, after the fact. So if you get back a list of people and you just want their names, you can, there's some syntax for doing that in the select clause. Um, but they don't, I don't think they do real property paths. They have their own thing for a lot of things. <laughs> but, it, but, it, but yeah, as far as Sparkle 1.1 goes. If I had an implementation, what's the rule on compliance? Is it like an open world assumption? Like, you know, on Sparkle 1.1, that's another thing. There's a test suite, and this is the conformance. If you pass the test suite, you're conformant. So you can be a superset of that. Yeah, oh, sure. I mean, and there's a lot of. Greg, uh, I really like that's these it. colors. Yeah. John picked the colors. Um, yeah, there's a lot of extension points built into Sparkle. In general, anywhere that Sparkle would return an error, either for the whole query or for uh, an expression, that's an extension point. Implementations are free to do whatever they want with that. Um, and you know, there, you can extend the syntax, right? Because basically this is the conformance criteria, right? It, unless we have like a negative syntax test that you are passing because of your extension, this, the, the test suite would never know you extended it, right? So there are a lot of extensions. Um, so you have to forbid like a function or forbid a triple pattern. Right, and this is what we've gotten stuck on a lot of virtuoso stuff. I mean, stuck. <laughs> if we ever wanted to move on, we're not stuck. <laughs> so, so this is all open. There's a full test suite. And if anyone knows people who have implementations, tell them to send us implementation reports. We're very interested in seeing other, you know, other columns here for implementations. Do you feel it's going to take some more time, or do you think it's going to, it's not going to be until one one is completely approved that we'll start seeing the other implementations starting to be more serious about conforming, or what do you think the road ahead is? It's pretty stable right now. I mean, the functions have gone have maybe been approving a few more some of the string functions. As far as the core stuff, negation, property paths, aggregates, all that stuff has been stable for quite a long time. So, then um, so, so I guess why don't we see this today then? Or, or is, well, know? primarily because almost all of these are open source projects, right? <laughs> so the reason Rascal doesn't, I suspect, is because it's mostly a one-man show and he's got a day job right, that isn't writing a Sparkle implementation. So, Do you know where Sesame stands? They claim to have a 1.1. I don't. They should send in a test result. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd love to see more green on this chart, uh, but haven't gotten anything so far. I know they did, and uh, I pinged them about it, I don't know, a couple months ago, I think, but haven't followed up on that yet. So, yeah. So, I mean, don't, don't let this uh, make you think that these are the only ones that support Sparkle 1 1 features. There are a lot of people that support big chunks of 1 1. These are only the ones that have sent in test results to the W3C. So. Like I said, spread the word, encourage people to send in more data. I guess uh, as this is finishing up, um, you mentioned a few places where you think uh, the next revisions, you know, once you talk to their, or go on further, there's going to be some improvement. Do you see any other areas that you'd like, things you wish was on one or things that, you know, further down the line might be coming into the standard? Um, 
I mean, I mentioned some of the things, right? I mean, so there, so I'm forgetting now what some of them were. So there were uh, ordering for like group concat. So the syntax of right, the semicolon separator equals. Actually, I didn't show that, did I? Well. Oh, this I was playing around with. I couldn't get a new line on that. We do a comma though. Um, here's the separator. So getting like ordering there, that syntax. Right. I mean, it's clear that that syntax should support. Right. Yeah. Order equals. But then you get sucked into well, can you just do ordering based on? I don't know how to have all the evaluation semantics would work out. Because at the point this runs, you've got these groups. So you can do anything, any values that show up. It'd have to be a value for that group. Yeah. No, it didn't agree. So, I mean, you can do ordering by variables or by expressions or whatever. And all of a sudden, the syntax explodes as to what you can put in here. So that's something I think people, some people want. Um, I don't know that we're far enough along to have that standardized yet because it's not clear how much people want or what the syntax should be. So this is where extensions come in, right? People will implement it. If there's consensus, it'll probably get standardized next time around. But um, as far as like open areas, I don't know. I mean, this is, this is such, despite the fact that it's like a one zero to one one in the version number, this is a huge step forward, right? There's, there's a ton of new stuff you can do with this. I'd be thrilled to see just this <laughs> widely implemented, right? Um, right. Let let the dust settle, and then we'll figure out what's next. Yeah. What do you? I guess. What are your thoughts on some of the other uh, Sparkle projects, like the what is it, the Geo Sparkle? And I know there's been a few other more specialized. Uh, like, do you see any of those yeah. merging eventually into the Sparkle? Those just kind of on the fringes. I mean, what are your thoughts? Do you um, Geo Sparkle seems really cool. I don't know that it's appropriate for inclusion in Sparkle in general because it's you know domain specific. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So uh, Geo Sparkle is a project to bring uh, geo geospatial primitives and operators into Sparkle. So instead of just uh, terms, so literals, URIs, blankos, you would also have geographic entities, so polygons or Right. So, so, and then they, they have, have operators as well. So you could say, you know, give me back all of the, I don't know, places within five miles of, you know, the, you know, this office. Or, and you can kind of fake some of that. We, you know, if you're just talking about points, you try to fake distances. But in terms of doing complex geometry, so intersections or containment, uh, things like that, this actually brings quite a lot of, of expressivity. Um, that being said, I don't know that it's so broadly applicable that it, it's worth bringing into Sparkle because it would be a lot of complexity for every implementation. Um, I like what they're doing, but uh, things like that and temporal uh, Sparkle, I mean, all these, there's a lot of cool projects going on, but. Um, Do you think those always be just like the, the main specific? Implementations, I guess, Sparkle and Maybe. I mean, extensions to Sparkle, extensions, right? Yeah. I mean, and the Geo one in particular, I mean, that's, it's a pretty big uh, niche, right? It has wide applicability. It's just that not everyone needs it. So it would be a pretty big burden on them. So is it not as extensions so that what however it extends 1.0 would also extend to one Yeah, I think so. Well, so, I mean, they add uh, some data types. So in general, I, I think they, they worked pretty hard. And all of this, I, I don't have a ton of, of knowledge about this, but uh, my impression is that they worked pretty hard to, to kind of fit it within uh, the existing constraints of Sparkle. So some of their primitives right, show up as lit like literals with a lot of stuff encoded in the literal, and it's a data type that indicates that it's a GeoSparkle entity, something like that. Uh, and that their operators you know, fit within the syntax of Sparkle. So. So the, the operators are just 
So it adds some more sparkle. sparkle. But it's, yeah. yeah. It's, it's got with some extensions, extensions so, so some magic on the predicate handling, which ARC, I think, pioneered, right? They, they had, um, you know, you could attach code to a predicate so that it could generate results for a triple pattern using that predicate. Um, uh, several implementations have done that. This just takes that and runs with it. Is there any, um, is there any discussion about adding uh, data into the um, I mean, you could kind of do that with the data set definition stuff, so just from the from clauses, right? So you could just say from your, 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 your premise and all of your other stuff. Yeah. I don't know that I don't know that that's really been talked about. It's certainly possible as an extension, right? But um, yeah, I, I don't there's not been a lot of discussion of that. Hold on. Well, I was just gonna say it was interesting uh, watching MySQL try to implement the SQL spec on Geo and said they did but they didn't. But you know, I mean it's sort of funny though. I mean, like it is it's relatively complex, so they didn't do it, but Oracle yeah. and Postgres yeah. did do it. Yeah, Post GIS is a pretty Yeah, I mean that has all the stuff. Is this what it is? Is it touching? Is it Yeah. And if I was to implement GeoSparkle, I think I'd probably base it on that because yeah. I don't want to have to implement all of that. Yeah. <laughs> My SQL just did it all on minimum bounding boxes, which is great unless you want to use polygons and then Right, then you're <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean a child could implement MBRs, so I don't know. Yeah. yeah. And in fact you can do that. Right, at the query level, just with a huge filter. Arithmetic, right? yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can do, you know, the max of. Yeah, max min, max min of the yeah. word. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, has there ever been any talk of supporting lists as a basic uh, data type? And you mentioned selecting out the elements of a list in order. What if you could just select the list? You know, have a you know, yeah. list constructor, a list concatenation function, and. There's been some talk of that. I think mostly that falls more under the RDF working group and the Sparkle working group. Uh, Sparkle's not generally in uh, the business of defining new, uh, you know, basic data types. I mean, it works on the RDF model with named, with like containers, right, named graphs, but it doesn't introduce any kind of new structures. Um, if RDF were to add that, I think there'd be a lot of interesting area for Sparkle to introduce new operators to work on them and, you know, there'd be a lot of, of interesting movement in that area, but I think it would have to come from the RDF side, not from the Sparkle well, side. Well, there is the collections vocabulary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, but that's not an atomic type, right? I mean, then you're still talking about representing stuff in RDF. Well, you know, a Sparkle binding set is not an atomic type. It's a concept that's in Sparkle. Well, yeah, yeah, but at the, the end, end of the day, day all the, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think, think uh, if you were going to do it, you'd have to really run with it and and introduce it as its own thing. I think try, we've seen what happens when you try to do it within the context of RDF. You end up with these crazy representations and making it hard to query. And I, I don't know. I mean, I'd love to see... I'd love to be proved wrong on, on that, but you know we've had a lot of time to, to do that with the existing system, and I've never run into anything that you know really seems like a great solution. Yeah, it, so. it wouldn't be a small step. For sure. Yeah. Are there any other questions? We're thinning out. Yeah, we're thinning out. All All right. Well. Unless there's anything else you want to show us, that's uh, the same great. Yeah. Remember to watch the uh, the Twig website, uh, tw.rpi.edu slash web slash twed to see um, whether next week we have a talk or a tax session. We're not going to have the, we might not have the uh, owl, owl too. Oh, yeah, this is a scheduling issue. Yeah. Oh, okay.
Yeah. If we can get someone else. Yeah. 